but that's all right. So let's get started on Jars of Clay. We have started a series of lessons on Bible evidences, and uh, this is one of them. We spoke earlier about nature as evidence for God and uh, the way that the Bible talks about it in Psalm, 30, uh, well, it's Psalm 19 and um, Romans 1 and other places, um, which is useful. But today, I want to talk about jars of clay because I want to start to focus in this uh, series about Bible evidences on the fact that the evidence for the Bible is the Bible itself. Its own internal character is the best evidence for the Bible. The Bible is the proof. If you're asking for proof, the Bible itself is the proof. <laughs> and we're looking at jars of clay based on this passage from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 through 7 where the Apostle says, What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. So this, again, is to say that there is uh, a real, uh, the God who created, spoke light into existence, has given us a real knowledge in, of the glory of God in that person, that is Christ Jesus himself. And even though the apostles have this revelation and are setting forth this word for us, what they say about themselves is that they have this treasure in jars of clay. So the treasure is God's word, is the revelation of God, the gospel of God, and the means by which it is transported is a jar made out of clay, which is say, to say earth, uh, earthenware, which is us. We are made out of clay, you may recall. The reason that is the case is to show the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. It's not about the container. We are the container, if you will, the jar of clay. It is about the, the content of that container, the treasure that is God's. That surpassing power belongs to God. It's not our power, it's God's power. And their focus is appropriate because we're talking about the fact that the Bible itself is written by people um, and that people are made out of clay and that you know people are fallible so when we say written by people we don't mean that God didn't write it we mean people wrote it down obviously and uh, the texts that we have that were transmitted by hand and the copies were made uh, so as to uh, you know, be transmitted around the world, they were done by hand as well. So the, the thing that needs to be talked about is these jars of clay, that can God's treasure nonetheless be transported in a jar of clay? Can he get his word across despite the frailty of the human? And it seems uh, that we have in Scripture a testimony about it. You know, it's not like a fairy tale. Uh, where, you know, you start talking about uh, witches and trolls, uh, dragons and spells and levitation, just as if, hey, yeah, they exist. Everybody knows they exist. What are you talking about? You know, that's, that's a fairy tale. The Bible doesn't do that. It is well aware that what it's talking about is impossible. <laughs> and it tells you that. And uh, it deals with this problem. So that's why I say the Bible itself is its best testimony. First thing that we would say about jars of clay is that the people who wrote this down, who recorded the scripture, often did so blind. Meaning they didn't know what they were writing about. They wrote what God told them to write. They didn't necessarily know why or what it was about. We start with the prophets, which is 1 Peter chapter 1. 
where he tells us about it quite plainly in verses 10 through 12 concerning your salvation the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the spirit of christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of christ and his subsequent glories it was revealed to them they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look that's pretty crazy that's first peter 1 10 to 12. so again uh you know i think it's a little bit hard to follow in plain language we should say there were prophets in the olden times who were prophesying about this salvation this grace that has come to us today in christ those prophets inquired carefully meaning it was important to them to find out and they asked what person or what time are we talking about here when the spirit in them was indicating and predicting the sufferings of the christ they were asking who is this and what time is this and it was revealed to them they were told they were serving not themselves but you so those prophets asked who is this when is this and the answer was not you not now that's what they got it's these things that have been announced to you now by those who preach the good news by the holy spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look the angels of god did not know the time or the person this plan was not understood by any but god himself the writers wrote blindly they didn't know what it was about they just wrote down what god told them to write down an example of one of those prophets is daniel in daniel 12 you find verses 8 through 9 at the very end of his, of his book after so many different revelations and uh you know there's a lot there and it's hard to explain and the only thing I can tell you is that if you look at it, it's very clearly the basis for the revelation of John. When John writes the revelation. It's very clear that he's borrowing mainly from Daniel. And Daniel, at the end of that book, is one of the prophets that Peter wrote about who inquired, what is this? And was told, not you, not now. <laughs> He said in Daniel 12, 8 through 9, I heard, but I did not understand. I said, Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel. The words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. He told Daniel, you go your way. You will be gathered to your fathers in peace. Just write this down. It's not for you. It's, it's for another time. That was the answer. So that's a non-answer well i guess it is a non-answer basically it's not yours to know times and seasons god has put into his own hands as jesus told the apostles in acts one but think about it moses wrote blind too um daniel wrote blind because he just copied. he wrote what they told him to write that he didn't know what it was for when he asked them what it was for he's saying i don't understand this they said that's fine just go your way it's for later as for moses you know the point of, of hebrews 8 is the point that we need to make moses is a blind writer as well even though he is a friend of god and many things are revealed to moses he nonetheless was following instructions particularly in hebrews 8 with the temple or the uh, tabernacle rather the tent the point, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent, the Lord set up, not man. They, who are serving today, serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. 
See, verse 1 said, this is the holy places, the true tent the Lord set up, not man. We do in Christ Jesus. But they, in Moses, serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, or foreshadow. When Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God in verse 5, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. When he says that, you know, and, and people say, well, that means it's important to follow the pattern of God. And it is important to follow the pattern of God, but that's not the point that Hebrews is making. The point Hebrews is making is they are not, that's not the real tabernacle. Those are copies and foreshadows of the real tabernacle. That's why God told him, see to it, that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. What he's saying here between the lines is, Moses didn't know what it was for. He didn't know why it was patterned that way. It wasn't his pattern. He didn't make this up. It was given to him. He did it because that's what God told him to do. And if you read the rest of Hebrews, you'll see that this is so. There's no way he could have known that the animal skins on the tent correspond to the jars of clay and the contents of the tent, the real treasures where uh, the communal, uh, communion with God is, you know, correspond to the tent that is Jesus himself who put on flesh and so on the outside had animal skins, if you will. But inside was the treasure of God, the Spirit of God, and so also with us. And he couldn't have known that the veil represented there was no direct access to the Spirit of grace while the first tent stands, which is the point that Hebrews is going to make. And so the rest of Hebrews is telling you all the things that it means, why it was configured the way it was configured, why the pattern was drawn the way it was drawn. That tells you that what we're saying about this is correct. Moses did not know those things. He knew that God said to do it this way. He did not necessarily know why. And that's an important thing to understand. They, they did what they were supposed to do. He related what God gave him to relate without understanding why. If anybody wanted to ask them, why would you do, why, why have it like this? Why wouldn't it be pretty on the outside? This is what God said. That's all he can tell them. That's all anybody can tell you. Well, it's true. Many of the people who wrote didn't know what they were writing. They just wrote it down. It's also true that they were bad actors. There were times when people did what was wrong. Does this prevent the transmission of God's word? No, it doesn't. David definitely sinned as an example of bad actors. Bad actors do not nullify the message of God. The fact that some of them did wrong doesn't change the nature of God's word. What we read in Romans 3, verses 2 through 4, is exactly about this point. The Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some of them were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one of them were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So he's saying, look, they were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were given what God said. They're in charge of the Bible, which is why we reject the uh, deuterocanonical books, sometimes known as Apocrypha. The Jews never accepted those books, and it was up to them what the Old Testament canon consisted of. They were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some proved to be unfaithful? Well, certainly some of them were. Some of them, you know, they certainly sinned in many uh, instances, and some of them were outright sinners. Those are bad actors. Does that nullify God's word? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. 
Let God be true, even if every single one of them were an outright liar. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what they thought they were doing, or what they thought they were writing, or what, what they intended by what they copied down. It just doesn't matter. God entrusted the oracles to them. He got his word across, regardless of the nature of the people who wrote it down that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Well, that's a quotation, you know. Do you know where it's from? I won't keep you in suspense for very long. But, it's from the Psalms. It was written by King David. If you go back to 2 Samuel 12, you can see where it's David's sin. His sin was when he looked upon the wife of another man, Bathsheba, and he took her to be his wife, and he impregnated her. And when this happened, he caused her husband to be killed in battle to cover it up. Nobody knew about it, just him. But God knew about it, and he sent Nathan the prophet to him. Second Samuel 12, 7 records some of this. Nathan said to David, You are to blame. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. And specifically, it's verse 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife Bathsheba to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Yes, that is something that David did certainly is a sin. The adultery is a sin. The, the lust is a sin. The lying is a sin. The murder is a sin. There's all kinds of problems here. Yes, he did wrong in this matter. And in Psalm 51, the purpose of this one, at verse 1, is spelled out to the choir master, the Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. That's how this starts. And in the end of it, it's verse 4, not the end, but the end of our reading here. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. You see why Paul quotes Psalm 51 like this? Because David sinned in this matter. And when he did so, he admitted, I have sinned and done what is evil. You are justified in your words. You are blameless in your judgment. The actions of David do not reflect on the faithfulness of God. And he wrote this psalm. And this psalm is inspired by God. This is scripture. This murderer, adulterer, no. I mean, he did this one time, right? And he repented of it, too. That's what Psalm 51 is about. But this man who committed adultery, who committed murder, who lied, all this stuff, is one of the authors of scripture, of Psalm 51. After having done those things, he writes Psalm 51, and that is canon. That is scripture. The Holy Spirit used him to write that. Despite his failings. That's why Paul says what he does in Romans 3. Even if they were a bunch of liars. It doesn't change the fact that this is the word of God. This is what God wanted to have written down. That's the point. That's why he said what he did in, in uh, Romans 3. The bad actor doesn't nullify the faithfulness of God. That's, they can't stop it. He was still used and still useful. And what he wrote down was what God wanted written down. And, you know, in the New Testament, we speak of the priest Annas, the high priest in the time of Jesus. In John 11, if you'll turn there with me. This one is hard to swallow, but it's true. 
because the Bible says so. Remember, and we're reading a bit here, John 11, 47 to 53, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we going to do? This man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation too. And one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He didn't say this of his own accord, though. Being high priest that year, he prophesied Jesus would die for the nation not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day, they made plans to put him to death. Now, it went kind of fast there, so think about this again. Who is this guy? Caiaphas. Oh, go over there. There you go. Caiaphas. Oh, go okay. back. Sorry. Who is high priest that year says, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand. It's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. What is Caiaphas saying? What does he think he's saying, right? What Caiaphas thinks he's saying is, You idiots, let's just kill him. Easy. The calculus here is simple. The whole nation will die if we don't. So let's kill him. That's what Caiaphas thinks that he's saying. But in fact, he's the high priest. He didn't say this of his own accord. See, what he thought he was saying is one thing. But what he said is recorded. You don't understand. It is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And you know what? That is true. That is true. Jesus died, one man, for the whole people, so that the whole nation would not perish, which is surely what would happen. If Jesus hadn't died for us, we would all perish because of our sins. That is true. That is scripture and scriptural. He didn't say this of his own accord, but since he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And we say he didn't say it of his own accord. What does that mean? Well, it means it was inspired of God. God caused this to be said and written because that's what God does. Let God be true, though every one of them were a liar. This one is a liar. But the word of God came through him anyway, because he was high priest that year. But if you follow the rest of the story, you know, they, they made plans to put him to death from that day on. Well, in Acts 3, you can read the rest of this. Acts 3... The apostles worked a miracle, healing a man who had been lame from birth. And they told the people, Acts 3, 13 to 15, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you instead and killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. First, first thing he says is, Pilate was trying to release this guy and you demanded that he be killed. You denied the Holy and Righteous One. You took Bar Abbas, an insurrectionist, a violent insurrectionist, instead. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses to this. 17th verse, he says, Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. 
but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Meaning, he brought it about in just this way. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. You see what happened here? <laughs> you guys demanded that he be put to death. Remember the priest, the rulers of the people, sought to put him to death, and this is exactly how they did it. And they won, if you will. They got him put to death by Rome. He said, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. So they're both bad actors and blind writers. Right? They didn't know what they were doing, but they were doing it. They were doing what? They were fulfilling the scripture. You acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, he has fulfilled in just this way. They didn't know what they were doing. They knew what they thought they were doing. But in so doing, they fulfilled everything that was written about him. In 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 6 through 9, as a commentary on this, um, I will read this to you. Among the mature, we impart a wisdom, yes, though it's not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We impart a secret and a hidden wisdom from God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this. If they had, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 9. Okay, so... People didn't get it. They didn't understand it. But it was true nonetheless. It was fulfilled nonetheless. The rulers of this age did not understand when they were putting him to death who he really was or they would not have done it. Just like you and I would not have acted the way we acted before we became Christians if we had understood who God was, what who God's son was, what he had done for us, what it meant for us to act that way. We wouldn't have done it. But I have another point to make. On the one hand, bad actors cannot nullify the message of God. On the other hand, faithful stewards can't fulfill it. Okay? There's nobody in the Old Testament or New who is good enough to be Jesus Christ. Nobody fulfilled it. Levitical priesthood is an example. Hebrews 5 speaks about this in verse 6 and verses 8 through 10. 6 says, it says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, who did that? Well, that's David. 8 through 10 continues, though he was a son, he learned obedience, Jesus, through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The others were not made perfect. He was made perfect. He becomes the source of eternal salvation to all of us who obey him. Why is that? Because he's designated by God high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Why? Why do that? Well, that's what Hebrews 7 is talking about. At verse 11, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, under which the people received the law of Moses. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than a priest named after the order of Aaron? What he's saying is, David lived at a time when the Levitical priesthood was in full effect. The Levites were offering daily, he worshipped under their tutelage, he lived under the law of Moses, and yet, by the Holy Spirit of God, he penned the psalm that says, You are my son, today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. 
Why should a man who lives under the priesthood of Levi write a psalm about an entirely different priesthood? Priesthood of Melchizedek. That's what they're asking in Hebrews 7, 11. A perfection, completion, had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood. And the Levitical priesthood was in full effect during the lifetime of David. What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek instead of one after Aaron, the Levitical priests? That's all that they're saying. <laughs> Why Melchizedek, if that was the end-all, be-all, if that was the perfect? It was good, it was right, it was what God expected, but it was never intended to be the completion, the perfection, Otherwise, why mention Melchizedek? And the law of Moses itself falls under this same condemnation, if you will, that the Levitical priests do. The law of Moses is right and good, but it's not perfect. Galatians 3, 21 to 22 tells you. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? No. No, the law is good. But, if a law had been given that could give life, well, then righteousness would indeed be by that law. If the law of Moses could have saved, well, that's how you'd be saved today. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. I mean, the, the Bible itself just imprisoned them under sin. The law of Moses gave no escape, it gave no solution, it gave no salvation. The offerings were offered continually, they were just a reminder of sins. The priests were prevented from continuing in office by death. Jesus no longer dies. This is the whole Hebrews argument, okay? But, in short, what the Bible says about itself is that that law imprisons everybody under sin. The promise made to Abraham was a promise by faith before the law of Moses. The law of Moses that comes later does not supersede that promise. That promise is fulfilled in Christ Jesus in those of us who believe in him. And finally, the saviors. Faithful stewards, you know, are faithful. There were many who were good and who were right, including the saviors, which is the judges. Uh, poorly translated judges. It should be saviors. Uh, even they, right? Hebrews 11.32 calls them out by name. What more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak. Notice Barak, not Deborah. Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. He calls them by name. These are the saviors. The judges if you will, the deliverers. <clears throat> what about them? He said, time would fail me to tell you of the faithfulness that they had, the faithfulness that they did. But what about them? It's verse 39. All these, though commended through faith, did not receive what was promised. God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So, yes, people in the Old Testament sinned, including David, who was a faithful king. He had an occasion of sin in this deal with Bathsheba, certainly, and when he numbered the people. But, as a rule, he lived faithfully. Anyway, point is, he nonetheless was useful for transmitting the word of God. You've seen that it... Uh, the law says about itself that these were commended, but they didn't receive the promised things. They heard about it. They greeted it from afar. It was coming, but it wasn't theirs. They didn't have it the way that we have it today in Christ Jesus. We have all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 tells you all about that. So this we say to show again 
that the Bible is its own best testimony. The fact is that we have these treasures in jars of clay. The Bible itself admits that the people who transmitted this were made out of clay and sometimes did what was wrong, sometimes intended what was wrong, but God still got his word through them. I think the example of the high priest is the most obvious and egregious example, but there are many. You can see why Paul would use David as an example in the matter of Bathsheba, because he ends up writing Psalm 51, which everybody concludes or accepts is part of the Word of God. It's canon. It's Holy Spirit inspired, yes. But it was Holy Spirit inspired and handed to us by a man who had committed adultery and murder who was being condemned. But he himself said, I have sinned. You are justified. That is the point. The word of God, yes, comes to us through jars of clay, but nonetheless comes to us intact. God gets his wishes. His word comes through. So this is more about Bible evidences. We have uh, one or two other lessons probably to talk about. But I thank you for your attention thus far. Um, we do always talk about what it takes to become a Christian, a child of God. If today you have not been living the life of God, we will help you to obey the gospel. We will help you come by water. We will help you fulfill the commandment of God that you might be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. If today you are a Christian who has not lived right, let us pray with you, for you, that you might be restored to God based on your repentance. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing. <laughs>